worship Jesus this morning. Amen. I don't know about y'all, man, but I need him. I need him. I, uh, we're told day in and day out what it is that we need by advertisements and by uh, people trying to force advice on us and all that kind of stuff. You need this and you need that. And man, you just got to have this thing. But I know that I need Jesus. And I hope you're convinced of that this morning. You need Jesus. And you know what? He's here waiting for you. He wants to pour into your heart. He wants to give you every single thing that you need today. And it starts with opening our hearts to him, saying, Lord, I'm ready to hear from you. I know that you have fountains of living water that you want to pour into me, and I'm ready to receive it. So if y'all would just indulge me for a second, could we stand? I want to open us up in a word of prayer. And what I would love to do this morning, could we just hold our hands out like this? This is a universal sign of, I need something. We have open hands ready to receive. And I want to pray and invite the Lord to come and fill these empty hands with exactly what it is that we need this morning. And then we're going to offer him praise and worship because he deserves it. Let's invite him in. Father, we stand here before you with open hands. Father, we are releasing whatever it is that we brought into this place. And we are recognizing that without you, Lord, we have nothing. We release our anger, we release our bitterness, we release our temptation, whatever it is that we have, Lord, and instead we say, God, fill me with your goodness. Fill me with your love and your mercy and everything that you are, Father. We need you more than we need any kind word from a stranger. We need to hear the voice of God today. So, Father, would you fill these hands and fill these hearts as we sing these songs of praise and adoration to you? Would you speak to us, God, because our hearts are ready to hear. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today.
church pray for revival. We pray that God will just transform the landscape of what's going on in our home, our city, our nation. And then so often it's happening around us and we don't even realize that. We're praying for revival and we have no idea that the boss at work that we have such a hard time dealing with has met Jesus and they're getting their life turned around. We're praying for revival through our struggling marriage and we have no idea that our spouse is grappling with the fact that there's a God that loves them and wants them to offer their life up to him. We pray for revival and yet we're so used to the status quo that we miss it as it passes right on by and we don't get to participate. I want to pray for revival with expectation that God is going to move, that when he moves in revival that we see it and we get to participate. Let this be our prayer for revival, that God would move and that our eyes would be wide open to participate in his revival. Dead is overcome. 
Reviving us, 
I judge my identity based off of how good of a parent that I've been this week. I judge my identity based off of how good of an employee I've been, based off of how good of a husband I've been. I judge my identity sometimes based off of what's in my bank account, based off of how many temptations I've been able to overcome. But let me just tell you, church, I don't know who needs to hear it, but your identity is found in Christ and in Him alone. You are a child of the Most High God. You were created perfectly in His image. And He wants to restore us back to that image He created us in. So if you're like me and you have identity issues, we need to latch on to this promise that I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I want to sing that again. And I want, if you're having trouble with identity, if that's something that you struggle with, would you proclaim this? Would you begin to believe it this morning? I am who I am because and only because the I am tells me who I am. So let's claim this promise. Thank you. 
the church the goodness of our God, that he's never run out on us, that his faithfulness never ends. can be seated. Pastor Maddie's going to come and she's got a couple of announcements and she's going to lead us in prayer. Good morning, friends. Um, all right, as we continue um, our time of worship, one thing that we do is we give back to the Lord. We worship Him through our giving, right, through our finances. And so we just want to invite you to participate in that. Um, if you would like to give, you can give in person in the black box back there, or you can give online. There are QR codes that you can scan. That's a super easy way uh, to say, God, I trust that my finances are yours, and you've blessed me with them. And so whatever you want me to give back, I will freely open my hands and give back um, to you. So uh, we're going to pray for our giving here in a minute, but I have a couple announcements in the life of the church to give you guys this morning. Um, one is that we have a, a teen event tonight called Vibe. We are doing this twice a month on Sunday nights, um, 6 to 8 p.m. We are just going to have a really fun time. We're going to play games, hang out, do a lesson, and just be together. So if you have teenagers, you know teenagers, come join us. We are going to have fun tonight. Um, I announced this last week, but next Sunday, we are going to start up again what we call Popcorn with the Pastors. This is just a very relaxed, chill time for um, the church to come to our house and eat popcorn, have snacks, have um, beverages, and just hang out. So we want to invite you guys next week from 3 to 5 on Sunday um, to come to our house. And, and enjoy that with us. We just want to be able to be with you in an informal way and to just get to hang out like we don't always get to on Sunday morning. So we invite you guys. You're welcome to bring friends to that um, or drag friends to that. However you have to do it, that's fine too. Um, one last announcement is that we have um, Heartseek Closet, you know, our, our clothing bank here. Um, we had uh, an open day yesterday and it was awesome. We saw a lot of families and it was really good. So thank you for your donations. Um, a special thanks to Taylor and her hard work in organizing the closet because, yeah, Yes, yes. It is wild. There's a lot of stuff back there, which is a blessing, um, but it takes a lot of work to, to do it. But one thing we need from you guys is we need Easter donations. So we are planning to, um, in our open day in March, we are going to do um, give away, of course, all clothing and that stuff that we have back there. But we also want to give stuff to the families for Easter baskets for their kiddos. And we want to do an Easter egg hunt for them. Um, so we are going to do that on the third Saturday of March. If you would be willing to donate um, candy, Easter um, eggs, the plastic Easter eggs, or any like small items um, that we could put in baskets for the kiddos, we would love that. So if you would bring that, um, you can put them in the tub out in the lobby, and then we can bless our community in that way. If you guys have kids, please bring them too. We would love to have your kiddos come join us for the Easter egg hunt. And if you're willing to help with that, um, we would also love, love, love that too, because it's going to take um, a lot of work. So um, that is all I have for you. Let me pray for you guys, and then we are going to get into the word this morning. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your people, your children that you've brought here today, Jesus. I'm just reminded that there's something so beautiful about community, about your family coming together. As imperfect as we are, we, we're, we're reminded of that in this song today, that I am who I am because you tell us who we are, God. Not because of what we've earned or, or what we've done, but just because of who you are, your spirit living in us, how you've created us. So Jesus, I just pray that you would bring us together in perfect unity today, God. Not because we agree with each other on everything, but God, because you are our foundation. God, would you speak to us through your body, through your word today? Would you be with Pastor Jake as he um, brings us the word that you've given him? God, would, would it be your words that speak through him? Would our hearts be soft and our ears be open? God, would we be able to put away whatever's on our mind right now just to hear from you? God, that's what we want. We want to hear from you. You're so good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey. Who's ready to hear the word of God this morning? 
Anybody? We have, oh, good. There we go. There's someone else as excited as I am. I get to, it's really funny, and I don't know why this is, but uh, for some reason, we feel it is way more appropriate to get excited about super mundane things than something as life-changing as the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We go to sporting events, and someone's like, let's get ready to rumble. We're like, yeah, I'm ready to rumble. Let's go. And then someone's like, who's ready to hear the word of God? And people are like, okay, (laughs) I've got my Bible, sir. (laughs) I'm ready. So uh, I hope that you get excited. And uh, I promise you, I, uh, it is not a front that I truly am super excited whenever I have the opportunity to dig into the word with y'all. Because time and time again, you know, I've studied scripture. I went to school to be a pastor. And yet every time I crack open the word of God, I know there's infinite capacity for my life to be changed for the better. And I don't know about you, but that is exciting to me. I could watch reruns of Friends each and every day. I could rewatch The Office 10 million times, and it's still funny. But the replay value of the Word of God is infinite. It is living, and it will continue to speak and change your heart and your life and give you fresh new hope each and every day. It is something to get excited about. So is anyone pumped to hear the Beatitudes today. Yeah, yeah let's go. I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, I'm just going to like dive right into it just as a, a brief little catch up to where we're at. In 2023, our theme is who is going with you. We are talking about how if we are pursuing the Lord of all creation and we know he wants to change our lives and give us hope unimaginable, we should be trying to take as many people with us as we can, Right? Uh, there was a, an evangelist, his name is skipping my mind, but he went on record to say, my friends and my family will go to hell over my dead body. We should be having that kind of resolve. We don't want anyone to enter darkness. They should have to kick and fight and scream getting past us because we are adamant that they are going to go see Jesus. We should be taking people with us to the kingdom. And we thought, what better way to figure out what it looks like to take people with us than to look at the life of Jesus Christ. So we are walking through the Gospels, and right now we've been working through the Beatitudes. And so uh, if this is your first time hanging out with us while we're talking about Beatitudes, unfortunately, you're three weeks late. (laughs) I'm in week three of the Beatitudes, um, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing good here. For you, because I promise you that there is. Uh, if you do want to look more into the Beatitudes, feel free to go back, listen, and watch those online. And I encourage you to dig into the Sermon on the Mount and read the Beatitudes and start asking some deep questions. Lord, what does this mean for my life? But we are going to start with our third set of Beatitudes this week. We are in Matthew chapter 5. So if you want to turn there with me, we are looking at the Beatitudes in Matthew. Uh, There are similar ones over in Luke, but we chose Matthew um, for no real good reason, just because we liked it. And so uh, we're in Matthew looking at the Beatitudes, starting at uh, verse 5, verses 1 through 12. And this is what the Word of God says. I'm reading from the NIV. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So where we are picking up, we've already been through blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we are looking at blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, and blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That is what we're looking at this morning. So we're going to jump right into it. We see here, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Those who show mercy also gain mercy. It's this very poetic, very fair thing in our mind, right? It is appealing to us because it's like, oh, I can get on board with that. That seems fair. I show mercy. I get mercy. That sounds good. We see, if we continue to look at this idea of mercy, we're going to unpack it a little bit. But mercy is an imperative in the, the Old Testament. And an imperative just means it was a command. It was something that when the Lord spoke it, he just assumed we were going to listen and do it, that we would show mercy to others. In the book of Micah, it says this, he has shown you, O mortal, that is us, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, that seems pretty straightforward, right? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Obviously, the three characteristics that we see here are justice or righteousness, if we unpacked it, mercy, and humility. And we talked last week a little bit about humility. And today, like I said, we are going to be focusing on mercy. This is a principle that doesn't just stop in the Old Testament, this idea of mercy. But Jesus was all about mercy. And also, not just Jesus, but his disciples. In the book of James 2.13, James said this, Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment without mercy gets shown to those who refuse to be merciful. Seems a little bit daunting, right? That should be pretty eye-opening for us. And it's not just James that says it. In fact, Jesus echoes this sentiment in Matthew 18. He's telling a parable of uh, the merciful master, or the merciful, uh, yeah, the merciful master. And it says this, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours. Because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. We see here that Jesus is painting this picture of a guy who had a huge debt and the master forgave it. Because he came pleading and said, Master, I just don't have the money. Can you please forgive me? And in his mercy, the master said, of course. And that servant then goes to collect a debt that was owed to him. And he refused to show mercy, even though the master richly lavished mercy on him. And Jesus had said, this is how my heavenly father will treat you if you refuse to forgive a brother and sister. Likewise, when Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, it's, one that we, it's a line that we often have trouble with, right? Uh, when he teaches us how to pray, he says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. When we come seeking forgiveness from the Lord, there's this understanding that Jesus was trying to teach us that when we ask the Lord for forgiveness, we also have to be willing to forgive those who are indebted to us. And this isn't just talking about money, y'all. This doesn't just mean, you know what, that $2 I loaned my roommate for that McChicken sandwich, I'll forgive that. It's also talking about the emotional debts, the psychological debts, sometimes even the physical debts in cases of abuse. If we're coming to the Lord asking for mercy and forgiveness, he demands that we have a heart of mercy and forgiveness. He continues Right after the Lord's prayer that he taught in uh, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Y'all, I'll be the first person to admit 
that there is some scripture that you have to do some commentary work on, and you have to figure out what the social context was, what the political context was, the geographical implications, all that stuff they teach you in Bible school. This is not one of those cases. This is pretty straightforward. Christ is saying, if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you. Wow, that should be alarming. It is a consistent teaching in the New Testament that not only do the merciful receive mercy, but only the merciful will receive mercy. When we hear this passage, it should give us pause, and we should ask ourselves the question, am I truly merciful? Do I even know what it means to have mercy? Or do sometimes I withhold mercy and forgiveness because in my mind, the people in my life do not deserve it? The people in my life have not earned my forgiveness and my mercy. It's just a thought. I don't know if you resonate with that. As we've seen with other Beatitudes, the biblical languages are hard, and it takes some unpacking because obviously Jesus didn't speak English. It wasn't even invented yet. And so Jesus would have spoken Hebrew or Aramaic, and the New Testament would have been written in Greek. So there are language barriers that we have to jump over, and I'm here to help you do that a little bit. As we've seen with other Beatitudes, it takes a little unpacking. So to fully understand what Christ was trying to communicate, we have to look at what Christ would have been saying in his language to his followers and all that were around there. Jesus, like I said, would have been speaking in Aramaic or Hebrew, and the Hebrew word for mercy would have been chesed. Probably mispronouncing that because I'm not a Hebrew scholar. But the idea goes way further than simply feeling sorry for somebody who's in trouble or in a tough situation. Chesed mercy meant to get into someone else's life, to fully see how they are seeing, to think the way that they're thinking, and to feel what they are feeling. It's way deeper and more connected than simple pity, which is what we often think of when we think of mercy. We think of those fantasy movies like Gladiator or whatever, where there's somebody in an arena and they have been beaten in combat and they're kneeling before somebody and they say, please have mercy on me. And the person looking down on them says, Ugh, fine, I'll spare you. It's almost this begrudging help that is given. That's the idea of mercy that we think of so often. But here we see that Jesus' idea of mercy would have been to look upon somebody and to feel what they are feeling, to think the way that they are thinking, and to be moved to help them in any way possible. This kind of mercy is most akin to our English word, compassion. Compassion, we've talked about in previous weeks, literally means to suffer with somebody else to co-suffer with them. So we relate with the people around us on such a deep level that we're able to feel the way that they're feeling and actually suffer with them when they're struggling. It is when we connect with people on that spiritual level that it becomes next to impossible to withhold forgiveness and mercy. We begin to understand them. We begin to relate to them and what they're going through. And mercy has the opportunity to come flooding out of us as a response. It is this kind of mercy that looks at the victim of abuse and says, this is injustice and I have to do something about it. I cannot sleep until I have helped this person. However, biblical mercy, we begin to see everyone in that same mindset, not just the victims, not just those that are in terrible circumstances. We're not talking just the victims of abuse, the victims of robbery, the family of a murder victim, but everyone that we see, everyone that is in our life, we begin to see with this sense of mercy. Because we see that Jesus, in his life, in Matthew chapter 9, he looked at all of the people around him. And his thoughts were, they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Y'all, he wasn't just talking about the ones living right. Because there were a lot of people listening to Jesus who were not living right. He wasn't just talking about the ones who had it all together, who went to temple every day, who had memorized their scriptures and had it bound on their heads and on their hands and all that stuff. He was talking about everyone that he saw. He was moved to compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus had mercy on them. This kind of mercy, to be able to look at even the most vile of offenders in your life and to choose to have mercy and compassion on them. It is not something that happens by accident, but it takes a conscious effort. We have to choose to open our eyes to those people around us and allow the Lord to give us that kind of mercy. Let me just tell you what. Have y'all ever tried, tried really hard to have compassion? How far does it get you when you try really hard to have the heart of God? Compassion. You might start feeling a little bit less annoyed. You might start feeling a little less agitated, but to have the real actual heart of God that beats for the person in front of you, that you can look in the face of someone who has abused you emotionally, that has run your name through the mud, that has just done terrible things, and you can look them in the eyes, and instead of hatred bleeding out, a love and a compassion wells up inside of you so that when you open your mouth, love comes out instead of anger and hatred. You cannot just try hard enough to have that kind of mercy. It doesn't exist in our human capability to just create mercy like that. It has to come from being in close relationship with God. He will give us that heart of mercy and only he can. It's this kind of mercy that enables us to have infinitely more forgiveness and understanding for people in our lives. We often forget as flawed humans that there is nearly always a reason why somebody did what they did or said what they said. Abuse victims oftentimes grow up to be abusers. People who grow up with emotionally unavailable parents often grow up to be emotionally unavailable and so harm people emotionally because of it. People that are financially stressed oftentimes lean into deceit and deception because it's easier to lie to get ahead than it is to be honest about their financial state. There's always a reason why the people are acting the way that they are. Nobody wakes up on a given day and says, you know what, I feel like being hateful today. I feel like despising everyone in my path, and I can't wait to cuss out the first person that I see. Man, this is going to be a good day. Nobody wakes up thinking that. But it's what's going on in their life that is taking over their heart that then pours out of their mouth because instead of being filled with the goodness of God, they are filled with the stress of their circumstances. When we have this kind of understanding, we are more easily able to offer forgiveness and seek reconciliation. There's a French proverb that says, to know all is to forgive all. If we knew what every person was going through at the deepest level, we would always be ready to offer forgiveness because we would feel what they are feeling and be like, wow, I had no idea that that's what you were going through at home. There is no wonder that you're talking to me that way. How could you say anything else? Because you are in so much turmoil right now. When you look at the way you're being treated, if you could look into the circumstances of the person treating you that way and realize that they are as broken as you are, and you could see the circumstances that led to the way they're treating you, we would be infinitely more capable of offering forgiveness. And that is what God did for us. He came not as an incomprehensible otherworldly God, but as a man who felt what we felt, who thought the way that we thought, who experienced what we experienced, and he had mercy on us, and he still does. So we ought to have mercy on other people. Instead of automatically assuming that everyone is out to get us, that it's just 
people's desire to get under our skin and to break us down and hurt us with their words and do things to make our lives more difficult. We should open our hearts to the compassion of God, let him fill us so that we can begin to think, huh, maybe they're just really struggling. Maybe God hasn't gotten a hold of their heart yet. Maybe somebody important in their life just ran out on them. Maybe they're suffering through a terrible tragedy even right now. And allow God to speak compassion and mercy into your heart so that you can begin to think, what is the reason that they're behaving that way? And I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes their reason is simply that they're living in sin. Sometimes that's the reason. When we're living in sin, sin comes out of us. So they don't know any better. They don't have the capacity to love the way that Jesus does because they don't know Jesus. But remember, Jesus showed us mercy while we were yet sinners. The book of Romans says so. While we were yet sinners, God showed his love and that he had mercy on us. So we ought to do likewise with the sinners in our lives. When we are able to co-suffer with them, to see them the way that God does, our hearts are capable of being flooded with mercy and forgiveness. So again, I echo my question to you, just to, just to chew on. Do you truly show mercy to the people in your life? Even to the people that do not deserve it. I know this week as I was preparing for this, I had to really evaluate my life. There are some people in my life that I have not been showing mercy to. I've been showing tolerance, and I think that that's good enough. I think that it is a godly thing just to hold my tongue when the people who are frustrating me are in my presence. But tolerance is not mercy. Mercy is so much more. Mercy is an act of love. Tolerance is an act of ignoring. I just ignore who they are and pretend it's gonna go away. So as we continue, ask yourself that question. Are you showing mercy to the people in your life? Even the most difficult, the most vile, the most hard to deal with people, are you showing them mercy? And you can be honest with yourself because much to our chagrin, God already knows. Yikes. God already knows what's in my heart and how I've been treating the people in my life. So I'll leave you with that question as we move on for just a moment. That was the first beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And why do we receive mercy? Two reasons. One, when we have mercy on people, we set an example for them and we set the bar, and suddenly it becomes more possible for them to show mercy to us. Have you ever been having an absolutely terrible day and then somebody is super kind to you and you wanted to say something grimy to them? You were like, oh, I just can't wait to tell them how I really think. And then they're like, oh my gosh, that dress that you bought, that looks so cute on you. And suddenly you're like, thank you, you look nice too. Like when you are kind to people, when you show people mercy, it unlocks within them the capacity to have mercy back. And we model for them what mercy looks like. Praise God. But also, the more uh, important one, we saw here in the words of Jesus himself, that if we do not show mercy, he cannot show us mercy. So if we want the mercy of God, if we wake up every morning and we are horribly aware that we are sinful at times and we desire God's mercy, we should probably reevaluate our lives and say, you know what, I want God's mercy. I should probably show mercy to others too. So that is why the merciful receive mercy. Moving on quickly, the second one was blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Once again, we have to dig into this biblical language a little bit to figure out what this beatitude means. When we are talking pure in heart, the word for pure had a few different meanings. For some reason, I forgot to write down what the Greek word or the Hebrew word for pure was, but uh, you can look it up later. That's some homework for you. But there are three different meanings for the word pure that Jesus would have been talking about, all right? 
The first meaning is this. It simply means clean. So it's the same idea that when your kids go out and they roll in mud, because for some reason that's what kids like to do, and then they come inside the house and they are filthy and soaked in mud, and you're like, clothes in the wash right now. And then you run it on a, you know, a super soapy cycle, and then they come out and they are no longer muddy. That is what Jesus would have been talking about with pure, clean. It is simply means to remove the stains, to remove the blemishes, to clean it, to cleanse it. That's one of his meanings of pure. The second meaning was often used in biblical times to refer, refer to corn, believe it or not. When they had taken the corn and they had harvested it and then they shuck it or whatever and then they're like removing the corn kernels so they can make corn meal and all that kind of stuff, they have to sift out the corn because there's a lot of impurities in the corn that they can't use to make corn meal. All the rough stuff, all of the kernels that didn't quite develop correctly, so they're kind of crunchy and gross. So in Jesus' time, they would have removed those corn kernels, and they would have sifted it in a big strainer-type thing so that all of the impurities would be removed. So when they were using the corn, it was only the pure, only the edible, edible corn. Likewise, they used the same version of the word to talk about an army that has been purged of all of the discontented, cowardly, unwilling, inefficient soldiers. They purified the army. They got rid of everyone that was not going to be ready to fight so that the army was only left with first-class warriors. Interesting. Corn and warriors, who knew? I resisted uh, the temptation to make a joke about that corn video. That adorable kid, it's cone. I twied it with butter and everything changed. If you know, you know. Um, and I said I resisted the temptation and here I am giving into it anyways. Uh, in a similar fashion, um, there was one other meaning. The final use of the word pure was talking about milk that had not been diluted with water to kind of cut it and to make it go further. Or metal that had not been mixed with another metal to form an alloy. This idea of not mixing, of having something be unadulterated and unmixed and wholly of one substance. So there's a couple different meanings to look at. When we're talking about pure of heart, we have this idea of a heart that is clean, which that one's pretty simple. How does our heart become clean? Sunday school answer. Jesus, our heart becomes clean when we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I need you because my heart is dark at times. It's dirty. I've sinned. And Jesus gives us a clean heart. So there we go. We knock off that one. We can be pure in heart by letting Jesus cleanse our heart. But then we move into this other idea of sorting out that which is not helpful, like with the corn or with the army where the general would sort out the soldiers that were not going to be effective soldiers. What does it look like to get rid of things in our faith that are not useful? To purify our hearts. To let Jesus remove the things that are not honoring to him. That are not going to help us grow in his fruits of the spirit. This should give us pause to examine our hearts. Is there anything in my heart that is not beneficial towards seeking the Lord? Is there anything in my heart that could be deemed inefficient in my desire to seek Jesus? Those secret sins that I haven't confessed yet that are holding me back in shame. Those things that I sometimes do in the cover of night when no one's around that I don't want my parents knowing, let alone the Lord of the universe. Those things that I let take the place of Jesus in my life, the TV shows that take my time and attention, the things that are just vying for my attention. What does it look like to let Jesus sift through those things so that all that is left is what is beneficial? Maybe it's a habit, a lifestyle, an attitude that we let the Lord sort through. To be pure in heart, we give up those things and we let the Lord replace them with better versions. Maybe we need to get rid of some of our motivations. 
This one is really hard because I'm a people pleaser. Anyone else a people pleaser up in here? Yeah. There's nothing quite as uh, stimulating as when somebody pats me on the back and says, dude, good job. And I'm like, nailed it. That was worth it. That was worth whatever I did. I know that it was stressful, but when you pat me on the shoulder and you're like, dude, you nailed it. Great job, kid. Then I'm like, okay, I can do it. I vie for people's appreciation, for their respect, for their attention. But what is our heart behind seeking the Lord? What is our motivation for coming to church and seeking him and singing these songs of praise? What's our motivation behind serving, behind giving, behind helping, even behind tithing? Any of the things that we're called to do. If we let the Lord look at our motives, are we doing it? Because we have a love and an adoration for the Father that spills forth in all of these acts, in serving, in ministering, in worshiping, in giving? Or if we're honest... Are we following these imperatives by God for sometimes selfish motivations? I give so that I can serve the least of these, but also so people can see how generous I am. I serve so that I can look good to the people around me. I come to church to worship so I can honor God, but also so that I can feel good about myself because I'm a good little Christian, and that's what good Christians are supposed to do. Self-satisfaction about doing the right thing can lead to pride that can quickly derail our motivations. Suddenly, we're doing the right thing less because it's the right thing and more because of how people applaud when I do the right thing. I begin to anticipate the thunderous applause of approval just because I'm showing up the way God requires. And then I wake up in the morning And I do something for God, not because it's pleasing to him, but because I know somebody's going to look at me and be like, wow, what a good guy that is. Got to be honest with you, church. That one hits a little close to home for me. And that's hard. Letting God inspect my motives. Am I doing what I should be doing because it's what God calls me to do or so that I can look good to the people around me? This is one of my favorite stories. John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress and like famous preacher, he was once approached by a churchgoer after preaching and the churchgoer clapped him on the back and said, man, you sure preached really well today. And John Bunyan looked at him with a a frown on his face and he said, the devil already told me that as I was coming down from the pulpit. Sometimes, We get so caught up in the accolades and the affirmations of others that we take our eyes off of the right thing and we look at the people who are clapping for us. We look at the people who are applauding us and the affirmation feels a lot better than just living in right relationship with God. John Bunyan knew that the devil could convince him not just to do the wrong thing, but to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And the same is true for you and me. The devil, when he knows that you're a strong enough believer that he can't get you to do the wrong thing, he will get you to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. He'll puff up your pride so that you're like, man, you know what? I am the biggest giver in church. I deserve respect for that. You know what? I showed up at VBS and I led all those kids myself because I'm the man and I deserve some accolades for that. Did you see the way that I stopped on the way to work and helped that guy with this flat tire? Man, no one else would have done that. Look at me. I'm so generous. I'm so kind. The devil will begin speaking to you and getting you to look at what people are saying about how good you are instead of letting you focus on the fact that you're doing what God called you to do simply because it's what God asked. Mixed up motivations will lead to us worshiping ourselves with our service instead of worshiping God. So I want to bring us to a close here. And I want to recognize the Beatitudes are really hard. 
If you're listening to me right now and you're like, whew, picked the wrong day to come to church. Pastor Jake's spitting fire right now. Unfortunately for you, there's another week left of Beatitudes, so you might want to skip that week too. The Beatitudes are hard, and I understand that. That is why Jesus put it first in his Sermon on the Mount. He wanted to set the tone for everything that he was going to say afterwards. You remember when Jesus said, it is easier for a rich man or for a camel to enter an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? The same is true for a lot of other sinful areas in our lives. Following Jesus is hard. We make it too hard sometimes, but it's hard because it will fight against our flesh every step of the way. Every time I surrender to God, I have to give up my pride. Every time I surrender to God, I have to humble myself and put others above me. And it is very hard. And Jesus knew that. But there is grace. There is grace, there is grace, there is grace. God does not demand perfection. He just wants our obedience. And so if you're listening to this today and you're like, whew, that is a tall order and I don't know if I can do it. You probably can't, and you certainly can't without the help of Christ Jesus. And knowing that you are submitting to him, he will give you everything you need to live up to these beatitudes. And it's going to be a lifelong process, but that's okay. Jesus loves to journey with us. So we're going to enter into just a time of prayer. I'm going to have Grace play uh, some piano softly for us, but I just want to leave us with a question as we seek the, God, seek the God of the universe in prayer. I ask the first question, are you truly being merciful in your life? Are you truly being merciful? And I ask a similar question, how pure is your heart? How pure is your heart? Are there things that need to be sifted out? Are there things that you need to give over to God so that you can make more room for his goodness? I know the answer for myself. Day in and day out, I'm reminded of how much I need God. And you do too. And so whatever it is that God is prompting in your heart, whatever new step of mercy you need to take, whatever new step of purifying your heart that you need to take, I encourage you in this time of prayer, let God help you make that step. We're going to pray together, but don't let this moment stay here. Whatever God is prompting on your heart. He wants it to go with you back home. He wants it to go with you to your workplace. He wants you to walk straight up to the people who are hard in your life and show them mercy because of what he spoke to you today. He wants you to go back to your house where it's easy to hide all of your sin and temptations. And he wants you to make a stand against the enemy because of what he did in your heart today. So I want to pray, but I encourage you, whatever God's speaking, Let him continue to speak. Yield your heart to him because he has so much goodness that he wants to pour into your heart. But he won't do it unless you let him. So we're going to pray. Feel free. We're going to, as soon as I'm done praying, we're just going to sing a chorus of the goodness of God. I've been saying this a lot the past couple weeks. The altars are always open for you to come and pray. If you need to just kneel and take a posture of bowing before the Lord and say, God, I need you. Nobody is going to judge you here. That is what they are for. Sometimes we need to get up and move our body and our mind will follow. So we're going to pray. If you feel like you need to come and pray, in a more reverent posture. You're always welcome to do that. You can pray right there where you're sitting, but don't miss this opportunity to talk to God this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the Beatitudes that remind us, God, that you call us to be merciful. You call us to have pure hearts. But God, we are also reminded that we cannot do it apart from you. 
So, Father, we open our hearts to you today. Fill us with your mercy, God. Melt away the feelings of bitterness and anger and maybe rage that we're feeling towards the people who have wronged us. Let us let go of those things, and as we let go, fill that empty space with your goodness and your mercy. Father, we yield our hearts to you, recognizing that there are impurities, there's areas of darkness, there are temptations and sinfulness that is preventing us from having a pure heart for you. God, would you take our hearts, would you purify them? Would you begin to sift out those areas of our lives that are not beneficial towards seeking you and your righteousness? And again, would you replace the emptiness with your goodness and your mercy? We need you, God, because we can't do it on our own. So, Father, we give our lives to you. Meet us here. Speak to us, we pray. We offer you our praise. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Your goodness is running out. Running after those people in your life that are hard to love. And the cool thing is, church, we get to show that goodness to the people in our life. We get to be a representation of Christ Jesus with our actions, our attitudes, our words. So y'all are invited to stick around. If you have time for our branch outs, we go back to our cafe after service and we dig into what we talked about today and we asked, man, how can I put that into practice in my own life? And kids are invited to go back and hang out with the kids. But let me just tell you, church, God's goodness is for you and he wants you to share it with everyone too. So as you go from this place, go being filled with the goodness of God and overflowing that goodness into each and every person that you come in contact with. God bless you, church. We'll see you next week.